Okay, let's take a look at chapter two, small molecules in the chemistry of life. This is just gonna be a basic overview of some of the main concepts, all right, from the review slides. We start off looking at atoms. We have protons, electrons, and neutrons. These are all the components of the atoms. Remember, protons and neutrons are found in the center of an atom. Protons are positive and neutrons are neutral. And then electrons orbit around the nucleus and they're negatively charged. So if we look at a picture of the atom, we can see the protons in the center and the neutrons there as well. And orbiting around it, we have the two electrons. And we can calculate the uh, atomic number, which is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. So the atomic number is just the protons. And you see it at the top of the entry on a periodic table. Now the atomic mass takes into consideration the number of protons and the number of neutrons in the nucleus. So this is the total mass of that specific element. We don't count the number of electrons because they don't contribute significantly to the overall mass. So the mass is how massive, how much um, is being taken up by this atom and in the nucleus it has protons and neutrons so we have to count them both to calculate the mass. Right? When we look at an atom or a specific element they come in different forms based on the number of different neutrons they have. So one element like hydrogen has three forms and they differ only in the number of neutrons they have. So these differences create what we call isotopes, right? Any element has any different number of isotopes, and we have to consider all of them when we decide that element's specific mass. So for instance, if we go back one slide, you see helium has atomic mass of 4.003. Now if you look in the nucleus, it only has two protons and two neutrons, so you would think that would equal four, but it doesn't exactly. And when we look at hydrogen, its atomic mass is not exactly one because it exists in different forms called isotopes. And you have to average the mass of all of the isotopes present to get the generalized mass for hydrogen. Okay, electrons are important. We mentioned they determine how atoms interact chemically. Okay, and the electrons are what are around the atoms, so they're what come in contact with other atoms first. And if we look at the elements in the periodic table, you can see the first row across the top, we have hydrogen on the left, helium on the right, and they have a shell, the first shell. That shell has one electron for hydrogen, two for helium, and now it's filled. Okay, that first shell only holds two electrons. In the next shell, if we go over to lithium, we have one electron. Okay, move across the table a little bit, then we get to carbon has four electrons, and we move all the way across to neon, that second shell holds eight electrons. That's the number it's trying to get to, eight electrons. So now that outer shell is full. The third shell then starts up, and it holds up to another eight electrons. So the, elect the atoms, um, the electrons are trying to get to eight total in the outer shell for the second, third, and further shells. Once that outer shell is full, we call that atom stable, okay, or inert. And these are the noble gases that they're very stable. The other atoms interact with other atoms to get a total of eight electrons in their outer shell. And so this is why they're reactive. And since they're reactive, they, they can participate in chemical reactions, and these reactions relate to forming and breaking chemical bonds. So here's a list of the chemical bonds in, from strongest to weakest. We'll start with covalent bonds are the strongest. We have ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and van der Waals forces. So let's take a look at all of these briefly. A covalent bond, the definition basically is sharing electrons. This is the strongest bond because their atoms, two atoms are literally connected because they're sharing electrons between the two of them. They tend to react with each other in a way to try to fill their outer shells. So here's hydrogen. It only has one shell, and that outer shell can have a total of two electrons. So when these two atoms come together, each hydrogen then has two electrons in its outer shell, and so each one's kind of happy. And that's hydrogen gas, H2. Okay. 
Here's carbon. This one's important, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about carbon in later chapters. So if you look at carbon, its outer shell has four electrons, and it's that's the second shell for carbon. And that shell can hold a max of eight electrons. And so if it interacts with four more hydrogens, each providing one electron, you get a total of eight electrons around this carbon. Okay, so the carbon's happy. Its second shell, outer shell, is filled. It has eight electrons. And each individual hydrogen's happy because its outer, each one of the hydrogen's outer shells are happy. They have two electrons. Okay, so this is how things tend to interact with each other. Now when we talk about covalent bonds, we have to remember um, an important type of covalent bond called a polar covalent bond. Okay, polar means charges, like a, like a battery has two different poles, a positive and negative pole. And this happens when two atoms um, participate in a covalent bond. They share electrons, and one of the atoms, like oxygen, doesn't share evenly. And that's because oxygen is electronegative. And electronegativity is the attractive force of the nucleus on the electrons around those atoms. So oxygen has a strong attractive force for electrons. So when it shares with hydrogen, it tends to pull them more towards the oxygen. Okay, this is very important, and we'll see an example with water in a second. Um, if we look at this table, what you want to note is that oxygen is, has a relatively high electronegativity. So covalent bonds with oxygen tend to result in polar molecules. Same with nitrogen, also relatively high electronegativity. So let's look at a water molecule, H2O. So there's oxygen, it's covalently bonded to hydrogens. The oxygen in this case is electronegative, so it's pulling these electrons more closely to the oxygen. Okay, it's not completely taking them, it's still sharing, but it's kind of pulling them towards it more. So as a result, the oxygen overall gets a slightly negative charge. We would say a partial negative. And that's what these little squiggles and the minus sign means. The hydrogens, they only have the um, a, a single electron, and so they donate it. It's more near the oxygen, so they re they have a partial positive charge. Okay, so overall, if we look at the water molecule, partial negative, partial positive is polar. Okay, and so we solve that polar equivalent bond. Remember, polarity is what gives water all of its unique properties. Okay, another consequence of polar Covalent bonds, as you create regions of molecules that can interact with each other and form hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds may form due to polar covalent bonds. So here's an oxygen covalently bonded to a carbon on this portion of this molecule. On the bottom, there's a hydrogen covalently bound to a nitrogen. Now, each of these bonds are polar, and they're causing partial charges to build up. Okay, so here's a partial positive by this hydrogen near the nitrogen, and this oxygen above it has a partial negative. So you have a partial positive, a partial negative, opposites attract, and it results in a hydrogen bond. Now it's not a literal connection, it's not a sharing of electrons, it's just based on these interactions of opposite charges. But you can see it's sufficient enough to take this molecule and actually curve it into this C shape. Right, so it's going to be something important we'll see later on. The next type of bond, then, are ionic bonds. Ionic bonds occur when one atom actually takes or loses an electron from another atom or element. Okay, so this occurs if one of the atoms is much more electronegative, and so when it, sh uh, it literally can strip an electron away from a different atom. Okay, so what happens is, if we look at this picture on the bottom, we have sodium on the left, chlorine on the right. Sodium has 11 electrons, has one in its outer shell. So what it could do is it could try to get seven more, then it would have eight, and it would be happy. Or if it loses one, now it's back down to this second shell, which already has eight. Okay, so it's kind of be happy in that state. Over here, chlorine, it has seven electrons in its outer shell. So if it can snag one extra electron, then it'll have eight. Okay, now what happens is if an electron, if an atom like sodium or an element like sodium loses an electron, it's losing one negative charge. Okay, so overall it's going to be positive. It's going to have 11 protons and only 10 electrons, so it'll become positive. This is called an ion, when an atom loses or gains electrons. Specifically, if it, if it loses an electron and becomes positive, it's called a cation. And you can remember cation is positive because the T looks like a C, or a plus sign.
And then the negative, the other atom that gains an electron is called an anion because it has, in this case, chlorine has 17 protons, and when it gains an electron, it will have 18 electrons. So overall, it has a negative charge. Right here, we can zoom in on it. Sodium, when sodium and chloride form an ionic bond with each other, sodium loses an electron, chlorine grabs it, so its outer shell is full. Chlorine's outer shell is full. Sodium's outer shell is now full. It loses one, so now it has eight below. Sodium is positively charged, a cation. Chlorine is negatively charged, an anion. These are opposite charges. They are attracted to each other, and that's an ionic bond. Okay, these two charged uh, elements come near each other, and that's an ionic bond. This is also why salt is able to be dissolved in water. If we look at this crystal of salt that's been dumped in this beaker, you see all of those ions lined up to each other forming ionic bonds that create a salt crystal. When it goes in water, the water molecules are able to surround each of the individual ions because each water molecule has partial charges. Okay? And each of these ions has partial charges, or full charges. So this negative chlorine, the water surrounds it by putting its positive hydrogens near it. The positive sodium water surrounds it by putting its negative oxygen near it. And that's how things get dissolved in water. And speaking of water, we mentioned it's, it's crucial for life. It's the kind of defining element that's required for life. Liquid water has lots of important properties. And here's a list of some of them that you need to remember. First off, it's structure, okay? It's polar, and this gives it very specific properties. Uh, some of these properties include its melting, freezing, and heat capacity. So when it melts, uh, freezes, and heat capacity, all related to its forming hydrogen bonds. We talked about specific heat, its ability to absorb a lot of heat before it changes temperature. That's important in maintaining our body temperature and water temperature and lakes and oceans and so forth. Heat of vaporization and evaporative cooling, this has to do with sweating. And when the water leaves your body, it pulls heat away from your skin. Cohesion, this is when the water molecules tend to stick to each other. This helps water travel at plants. And surface tension. Okay, the last slides here, we just want to briefly talk about acids and bases, and I'll refer you again to the full slides to get um, some of the other figures. So an acid, we'll just go with the definitions from the book, dissolves in water, they release hydrogen ions. Well, we're going to call these protons sometimes. Okay, we'll be talking about hydrogen ions and protons a lot later in the class. Bases uh, accept hydrogen ions. Okay, buffers maintain a constant pH of a substance. pH, remember, is a percent hydrogen ions. Okay, percent hydrogen ions. So buffers help maintain the constant pH. All right, so that's a basic overview of chapter two.